And good morning and welcome to the eighth annual PKF Francis Clark AIM update event. Um, this event is aimed at FDs, CFOs and audit committee members of AIM listed businesses and those considering such a listing. My name is Duncan Leslie and I look after a number of such clients as audit partner and also second partner on uh, as a reviewer. I've been working in the AIM market and around listed companies for well longer than I'd like to admit but no 20 years or more um, both at the top end where clients move up to the main market but also some that are struggling a little bit more than they, than we would all like. Um, those that have reasonably recently entered the market um, and of course everything in between as well. I think we all know it's a challenging environment at the moment and in my experience of working with AIM businesses it's probably about as challenging as I can remember for AIM in that time. There's you know much greater competition and access internationally for investors um, and a lack of new entrants for a number of reasons. So I think it's going to be a really interesting session this morning from uh, Mike Coe uh, of Zeus Capital, where he might touch also on the impact of regulation. As we know, AIM is supposed to be relatively light touch compared to the main market, and that is a double-edged sword. Regulation is obviously helpful, but also costly, um, and that then will lead us on to our guests from the FRC, led by Jonathan Compton, who will be discussing with us um, what they are seeing under their corporate reporting review. So I hope that sets things up nicely for you. So with uh, no further ado, over to Mike. Uh, thank you very much, Duncan, and good morning, everybody. As Duncan's mentioned, I, I'm going to uh, give you hopefully a, um, an overview on AIM and the, the broader market in 24. Uh, I'm gonna look at some of the market reforms that have happened um, and um, flag some areas where perhaps it would be nice to see some uh, reforms in the future. Uh, and then I'm going to end up uh, taking a quick look at um, some of the changes in the new QCA code. Um, uh, for those who um, um, don't know me, and I have, have had the privilege of doing this, uh, this slot on a number of occasions now, um, I, I, um, I, I've had a change of, of a house since I last spoke to you um, in uh, July of this year. WH Ireland was uh, acquired by uh, as Zeus Capital. Um, Zeus is a, an independent full service investment bank um, providing um, the same services essentially as WH Ireland did, but, but, but with um, deeper and wider resource. Um, Zeus has an enviable track record of um doing I ipos when there were ipos to do uh and um uh, another notable difference with wh ireland is it has a uh, a much uh better capability in the m a market uh doing deals um both sourced in the in the uk and using a, a very active um overseas network so i i'm delighted with the change i'm excited for my clients and um as i enter the uh the last third of my uh, working career, uh, I'm excited with the uh, platform that I'm provided with. So, um, uh, enough of the commercial, um, uh, um, and we'll move on, please, to the next slide. So, AIM in 2024, um, as Duncan's already hinted, it's been pretty tough. Um, we've seen a, a further decline in the, the number of companies on the market. End of August, there were 704 with an average market capitalization of. Uh, 108 million um, uh, of those companies, 74% um, actually had a market capitalization of less than 100 million, and probably 60% have a market capitalization of less than 50 million. So uh, uh, the often spoken about average market capitalization statistic is slightly, slightly misleading. Uh, it is still a market for smaller companies. Uh, the middle proportion of this slide uh, gives you an idea of the activity levels in the market, uh, both in terms of the number of IPOs, the number of primary raises for those IPOs and, and secondary raises. If you look at the chart on the on the right hand side, you'll see that 22, 23 and 24 have all been very low activities in, in relation to uh, the, the, the previous 10 years. Um, 
24 has been a, a, a bit of a mixed bag. There was a bit of optimism early on, but that um, that quickly evaporated and at, the, at the moment. In terms of the number of IPOs and secondary issues, it's looking um, slightly worse than last year, although I suspect by the end of the year, uh, it will end up looking pretty similar, um, but very, very tough out there. Um, in terms of the broader market on the on the next slide, um, historically, of course, you would expect um, smaller companies to outperform uh, the, the FTSE 100. Uh, and here there's just a, a, a bit of context around that. I need to apologize for the graph in the top right, which is incorrect. There will be a, um, a further distribution of this presentation later with that corrected. So forgive me for that. But the top left shows uh, the performance of FTSE 100, FTSE 250 and the AIM all share um, post the banking crisis. Um, you can see over that period, the top performing index has been the FTSE 250. Um, uh, AIM uh, outperformed for most of that period, the FTSE 100, but uh, is now about back level pegging. Um, FTSE 250 is up um, uh, about 213% over that period, with um, uh, FTSE 100 up about 80%. Um, so uh, uh, probably reflecting what you'd expect in terms of risk and reward. Um, Post-COVID, um, what you might expect had, has actually reversed. So the FTSE 100 has been um, the, the top performing index uh, since since COVID, uh, and particularly as the, the markets have gone have gone risk risk off, um, and and that post COVID um, chart there bottom left is reflects exactly what um, the opposite of what you'd expect. FTSE 100 at the top, then the 250, and then the AIM index. In 2024, actually the FTSE um, has 100 has also outperformed just about the other two indexes, the FTSE 250 and 100 are broadly similar. Actually, since I last spoke to you uh, last October, the, the FTSE 250 is up 13% compared with about uh, 9%, seven, uh, sorry, 7% 7 in the FTSE 100. So we're starting to see um, uh, uh, investors looking for value further for lower down the food chain, as it were, but unfortunately, that has not yet reached uh, reached AIM, and AIM has continued to um, to, to struggle and is essentially uh, flatlined in the in the in the last twelve months. So um, uh, very very tough in terms of sectors. On the next slide, these are sectors um, specifically related to to AIM. Um, just showed a selection. We've got technology healthcare, financial services, as well as the all share. Uh, the pattern's broadly the same. Probably no surprise that over the last 12 months, technology's been the outperformer. Uh, that would be true across um, the world markets, although that bubble is deflating slightly now. Um, the patterns are quite interesting. Um, from February to, to May there, you can see that there was a um, uh, there were some increases in each of each of those those indexes. I think that was a uh, a reflection of some of the optimism there was early in the year when perhaps we thought interest rates were going to come down slightly more quickly uh, than than they have. Uh, and before we um, got into the uncertainty of the the election periods, both here and across Europe, and and now of course in in the in the US. Um, uh, in the last um, couple of months, um, there's been a, another sharp decline, and if we extended this uh, graph to today, the decline would have would have increased in in in, in aim as anxiety around um, what might happen on the 30th of uh, October in the in the budget is uh, foremost in people's minds, and uh, there are a lot of doom mongers out there in in terms of what might happen and what its impact on the market will be and i'll touch on that a, a little bit more um later on um this time last year on the next slide i started to talk about um 
uh, market reforms. Um, I flagged to you that um, uh, there, were, there were reforms coming in the, in the main market. Um, they have now happened. They came into effect on at the end of July. Um, essentially, th the segmentation that there used to be between the, the premium segment and the standard, standard list is gone. There's now just one market. Um, the ESCC, equity shares in commercial companies. So it's just for trading companies. Uh, to be on that market, you've got to have a market capitalization of uh, greater than 30 million. Um, and with that new market comes a revised rule book that has relaxed a lot of uh, the previous rules. So changes include um, uh, shareholder votes are no longer required for um, significant um, transactions. Uh, they are required for reverse takeovers, but nothing below 100% of your existing size requires shareholder approval any longer. Um, shareholder approval is no longer required for related party transactions. Um, that now adopts an A model where you need a, an independent director uh, um, accredited by a, a nomad, or in this case, a, a sponsor that that the transaction is fair and reasonable. Um, the free float requirement has been relaxed um, uh, and there's greater scope for controlling shareholders. Although um, if you have a controlling shareholder, you must be able to demonstrate that you're able to carry on your business independent of, of, of that shareholder. Um, very significantly, um, there's no specific financial information required, i.e. you don't need a trading record any longer. Um, and all of that has resulted in a, a modification of what uh, sponsors need to do and, and uh, uh, when they're required. So you're not required to retain them, you never have been, but the certain activities um, that require you to engage a sponsor to, 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 to liaise with the FCA, uh, the number of times that's now required is, has gone down, which will reduce the cost for companies. Um, you are still required to get shareholder approval for certain things, including buybacks, um, uh, non-preemptive share issues that are outside uh, accepted authorities, um, employee share schemes, uh, longer term incentive plans. And of course, you uh, not only you've got the regulation, but you've got the reporting requirements, the reporting requirements, uh, you're required to uh, ad adopt the UK corporate governance code and comply on it or explain uh, your compliance in respect of that code. And you've also got to meet the reporting requirements of uh, the climate and diversity disclosure requirements. So, but the effect in regulatory terms is to uh, uh, significantly reduce the differentiation um, with, with AIM. So where does, where does that leave, leave AIM? Um, on the next slide, we'll see um, that, that there's been, um, uh, you know, the background here is AIM has been a market that's been supported by effectively government tax incentives through EIS relief, ECT relief, um, uh, business property relief for, for entrepreneurs uh, and, and inheritance tax. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of concern that there could be changes to some or all of those taxes. If there are, that could lead to volatility. Um, that would then be in the context of a market that's uh, that's already reducing, where we've already got challenging IPO market that's being stifled by all sorts of factors, uh, macroeconomic and geopolitical being amongst them. Um, and we've been in a situation where there have been continual outflows of money that the institutions have to invest um, uh, over the last few years. Through the last four years, have seen net outflows flows of funds available for investment. Um, so, you know, the backdrop to the market is fairly gloomy, uh, and there have been um, a lot of parties uh, trying to lobby for for changes. That would include the the stock exchange and the, and the QCA. Um, We've also seen a couple of papers recently come from uh, Peel Hunt and, and, and Grant Thornton um, uh, pointing out the importance of AIM to the UK economy uh, in terms of business creation, job creation and, and growth, 
uh, and pointing out that actually uh, the aim market fits very well with with the, the government's desire to create good jobs and productivity growth in every part of the, the, the country. So, um, you know, the, the theme here is that AIM is, um, has been a successful market and it, it does, deserves continued and, and now, in fact, enhanced support. Um, how do we get that support? Um, Peel Hunt um, set out in a paper a number of measures that, that, that could be considered. I, I won't read them, them all out, but a couple of the interesting ones were perhaps for the um, uh, remit of the British Business Bank to be extended to include equities um, for the more funds to be directed towards um, the business growth fund um, uh, uh, for t the uh, for regulations around ICES and SIPs um, or the VCT and EIS limits to be changed. Perhaps uh, on the EIS you could raise the qualifications um extend the periods uh, there's a number of things you could do um i think for me perhaps the most significant of all would be if we could somehow devise uh um, some regulation that obliged our pension funds to invest uh more in the uk and a proportion of those funds in the uk in, into aim um uh, you know, 20, 25 years ago, I think it was 30 plus percent of pension funds were invested in the UK. It's now down to um, uh, about 8 percent. Um, uh, other countries, including Australia, ha have a requirement for their funds to 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 invest in country. Uh, I think if we could do that, that would make a very significant difference to uh, the equity market and particularly given its size. Um, to, to aim, so uh, I'd like to, uh, I'd love to see that. Will we see that? Um, I think it's probably unlikely in the, the the current budget. I suspect the government will have um, uh, what they perceive as more important issues to to, to address. But um, uh, uh, I think the pressure will be growing. Uh, otherwise, um, aim is in danger of becoming a a, a legacy market. Um, where do I where, where do I see the market going going forward? Well, um, obviously, um, I'm uh, no more of an expert than anyone around the table here, so um, this doesn't constitute financial advice. But I, I I guess I look at it in in, in a number of ways. I think um, aim as a market. I think some changes really have to change, and the immediate prospects. Uh, uh, are not are not are not rosy without without change. That doesn't mean it's uh, the right market for for companies to to be on, or um, or to come to. Um, but in the longer term, it, it doesn't at the moment look like a a growth market in terms of the number of companies on it. Um, in terms of uh, valuation for companies that are on the market, we've seen obviously um, depressed performance from. AIM as an index, um, valuations are low, uh, cycles change, um, people will have to hunt out hunt out value, and I have no doubt that um, that will change. Um, the outflows that I referred to earlier seem to have stopped. Um, I wouldn't say we're now seeing significant inflows, but at least the outflows have stopped, uh, and hopefully that re represents a turning of, of the corner. Um, I think quite interesting. I think the UK is starting to look a, a, a bit more of a safe haven than it than it has done over over recent years. Um, uh, problems in 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 Europe with the rise of uh, the far right issues in the states. I, I think uh, the UK is looking more attractive. The pound strengthening. Um, I think we will see. Uh, with the US interest rates now coming down, coming down across Europe as well, I think there'll be further interest rates cuts to come. And I think regardless of what happens in the budget, I, I think what the markets have been craving over the last few years is some stability and certainty. Uh, and I think the budget will give that. And I, I'm optimistic that once we, at least we know where, what the position is, um, we can get on and fund managers can invest, uh, private investors can invest with some confidence and we'll see uh, a recovery in, in, in markets. So that, that's my 
my my hope on on valuation. Um, finally, I wanted to touch on um, the QCA code. Um, Ninety three percent of AIM companies adopt the QCA code. Um, uh, the new code um, uh, is now applicable. It starts for years commencing after the 1st of April 24. There is a 12 month transition provision available. Um, interestingly, the QCA have just written um, to us, probably written to lots of people, uh, pointing out that uh, lots of companies who adopt the QCA are not members of the QCA uh, and haven't even acquired a copy of the code from the QCA. Uh, so I think there might be some pressure on those who who, who, who haven't yet invested in that document to, to do so. You don't have to be a member of the QCA to get the code. You can separately purchase it at a very reasonable cost, I think, of about £450. But uh, uh, they're certainly on, on that at the moment. So what does the new um, code look like? Uh, it's very similar to the old code, to be to be frank. The changes are quite nuanced, um, but that doesn't mean they, they aren't uh, significant or won't cause you ad additional work. There's been a, a, a bit of rejigging of the principles. The numbers of uh, the principles have cha changed around. A couple of principles have merged, but there is only one new principle, and that's in relation to a remuneration which uh, pretty much follows the, the guidance that was previously set out in their their remuneration committee guide um, it, 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 it's not rocket science i think it's probably what most people do anyway um, the board should establish a remuneration policy that promotes long-term growth and shareholder value policy should, should be simple and easy to understand i think we all recognize that um, similarly appropriate incentive targets should be set um, here, here's a bit you might want to take note of. The annual remuneration report and policy should at least be put to an advisory vote um, of shareholders uh, uh, each year. Uh, and again, I've, I've bold, put this one in bold because I think this is worth noting. Uh, new share schemes and long-term incentive plans should also be put to a shareholder vote. That hasn't been a requirement on AIM. It's been good practice, but not a requirement. But I think now you would be expected to do it. Um, in terms of um, the other changes, um, uh, there's some themes running through them. Um, uh, first theme is really the purpose and culture. So. Principle one uh, now sets out that the company needs to state its what it calls its essential reason for being. I think we all need to know what our essential reason for being is, but um, and the company's business model, strategy, and objectives should then flow from that core purpose. Um, remuneration should align with that purpose, strategy, and and, and culture. Um, second theme is environmental and social considerations. Environmental responsibilities are now explicitly referred to in principle four. Um, climate related risks are specifically uh, referred to in principle five. Um, the requirement that existed for boards to keep up to date and have the necessary skills and experience uh, is still there, but it's been in, uh, expanded to say, those skills and experience should also include addressing sustainability and climate change issues. Um, amazingly, um, amazing that it wasn't there before. The workforce has now been identified as a, a key stakeholder. Uh, and another particular one to note as a, a matter of good order, um, board composition, independence, diversity, uh, shareholders should be given the opportunity to vote annually on the election of all directors to the board. Uh, I know there have been some early adopters of that, but I, I would suggest that most companies are still on the, the one third retiring by rotation uh, as required by their articles. The QCA code is now saying all directors should be re-elected. So that's something for, for everyone to note. Um, and I think that's about my allotted time, and I'm I'm done. Very happy to take questions at the end of the session, but uh, I hope that's been relatively clear. Thank you. 
Yes, thank you, Mike. And yes, just to say, if anyone does have any questions for Mike, very happy to take those now while it's fresh in your mind, or if you do need some time to um, uh, to think about what those might be, then it, Mike will be around at the end, as with all our speakers. Um, but if you do have any questions now, then please don't be shy. And while it's fresh in your mind, I just thought I'd give you a chance before we do move on. Not seeing or hearing anything at the moment. So I think, Mike, you've escaped for now. So thank you for that. Yeah, it was um, obviously very clear. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And um, so that uh, leaves us to move on to Jonathan Compton. Hi there. Thanks very much, Mike um, and Duncan. Um, so hi, yes, my name is Jonathan Compton. Um, I'm a case director in the corporate re reporting review function uh, of the FRC. Uh, I'm joined today by my colleagues, uh, Robert Carter uh, and Colin Wheeler. Um, what we're going to cover today, well, um, I'm going to give you a brief uh, overview of, of who we are and what we do. Um, and then I'll hand over to, to Rob uh, and Colin to do the hard work. Uh, Rob is going to talk about uh, the large private company thematic uh, that we issued uh, a few months ago. Uh, now, why you might ask, uh, are we talking about large private company thematic on an AIM webinar? Uh, well, there are two principal reasons for that. Um, first of all, the level of reporting requirements that apply to AIM companies is, is rather more similar to, to that applies that apply to private companies uh, compared to uh, full list companies, for example. So I think there are some similarities there. And often, um, AIM companies are, 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 have got rather more constrained resource uh, resources allocated to reporting um, similar to, to private companies. So I think there are quite a few um, uh, quite a few similarities there. So that's what Rob was talking about. He'll then go on to give you a, a very brief overview about the uh, recently the very recently published uh, annual review of corporate reporting. He's not going to say very much because um, if if he whets your appetite uh, sufficiently, there's a dedicated webinar about that that the FRC is, is doing on the 17th of October that you can sign up for uh, via the FRC's website. Uh, once Rob's done with that, uh, we'll move on to Colin. He's got a few uh, words to say on the quite recently published uh, offsetting thematic, which is a, an area that um, from my prior experience, I know there's has passed a, a number of uh, preparers by or, or, or we see a number of errors. And so it's quite an important uh, piece of work. And then I'll come back uh, to, to just wrap up before we can take any questions. Uh, so moving to the next slide. And next on, please. So uh, who are we, the FRC? Well, um, we are uh, the regulator that sets, um, uh, sets standards and monitors uh, corporate governance, reporting uh, and audit. Um, the remit is really broad, actually. So we set the standards for auditing and also supervise and monitor uh, the firms uh, and uh, uh, accountancy bodies. We set UK GAP. Um, we set the UK Corporate Governance Code. We also uh, set actuarial standards. Um, I'm not sure how that snuck in there, but uh, that, that's uh, another thing that we do. And finally, um, and I guess most importantly, from my perspective, uh, we monitor financial reporting. So um, CRR, Corporate Reporting Review, where uh, myself, uh, Rob and Colin work, uh, its principal objective is to ensure that companies' reports and accounts comply with the law and other reporting requirements. Uh, we also try uh, to um, encourage improvement uh, in, in, the, in the clarity uh, and quality of, of um, corporate reporting more generally. Uh, we like to try very hard to work collaboratively with companies, which is not an adversarial um, sort of interaction that we, we have. Um, and um, that's conducted mostly through written correspondence, but sometimes through meetings as well. Uh, we do have statutory powers. Uh, we've got the power to uh, apply to the court to force a company to change their reporting. Uh, and we've got a power to demand information. Certainly the first one I don't think we have ever used. We've always managed to, to um, settle our, our, uh, our cases uh, by sort of mutual agreement. Uh, although I do understand we have got to the steps of court literally uh, 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 on, one, on one occasion. Uh, the power to demand, again, we very rarely exercise that power. Companies are usually fairly forthcoming with, in their correspondence with us. Um, but uh, again, we have used the power on one or two occasions, uh, but that's mainly more at the request of companies because they've had some sort of legal sort of a, a, a reason to, to, um, to want some protection for us actually exercising a power rather than them providing information voluntarily. 
Um, so the next slide, please. Um, so our um, our remit and scope uh, is quite uh, quite complex. It's driven by uh, several bits of legislation that I won't bore you with today. But if you look on your website, uh, on, on sorry the FRC's website, then you'll see uh, you see it all set out for you there. But broadly speaking, we cover uh, companies that are listed uh, on the main market, both premium and standard listed companies. Uh, we cover large companies. Now, that obviously includes all of AIM companies, no matter what their, their sort of fundamental size, because they're all public listed companies and therefore ineligible to be uh, small or medium sized uh, and large private companies. We also cover LLPs. Our principal occupation, uh, no, state, <laughs> our principal occupation is uh, the annual report and accounts. Um, so uh, that um, we we cover uh, our remit officially covers the strategic report, the director's report, and the financial statements. For full list companies, we look at the TCFD um, re reporting, which is driven by the listing rules. Uh, and for AIM and private companies who are uh, within the um, scope of the the climate related financial disclosures requirements uh, that come in relatively recently, uh, they are they are in our scope as well. Officially, corporate governance arrangements and remuneration reporting for full list companies and indeed AIM companies is not in our remit, but ahead of uh, our um, proposed transition to ARGA when we'll get um, uh, coverage of the entire annual report and accounts, we do look at a selection of, of full list companies, corporate governance reporting and re remuneration reporting. What don't we look at? Well, we look at the, um, the interims for full list companies, but we do not look at the interims of AIM companies. They're not in our remit and neither are the preliminary announcement or investor presentations uh, of any company in our remit. So we, so we don't look at those um, in, a, in a sort of a regulatory on a regulatory basis, although we may look at them for, for other information purposes. Um, next one. Thank you. Uh, so our work is done mainly through um, uh, through a desktop review of the document that we're, we're looking at. Um, people uh, in, in our in our team, uh, the staff in our team will will take a look at those those accounts um, and other information which is in, in the public domain normally, although we do have some some interactions with the AQR, the audit quality teams in the FRC. Um, and we will um, write one of three types of letters to the companies that we, we look at. In rare, rare cases where we haven't found anything uh, to, to say, anything of any sort of material consequence to say of a set of accounts, we'll send a company a, something we call a no issues letter, which just explains that we've looked at your accounts and we've got nothing to raise at the current time. Much more likely is, is um, a letter with, uh, with uh, some, some technical points in it, uh, and that can range from a simple appendix letter, which is where we've, we've, we've spotted a number of maybe smaller or less material um, uh, areas of potential non-compliance that we're just drawing to your attention. We leave those points to you and your auditors uh, to consider and to correct if you think they're material and relevant. It's important to say that uh, it is not a checklist of things you must put in your accounts next time round. Uh, that appendix, uh, it is only if they are material and relevant. The other sort of letter we write, and it's probably, um, well, it's, it's probably about sort of 60% of the cases, I think we, we write one of these letters and that's called a substantive letter. Now that's where we think there, um, there, there is or may be a question that the, the, the accounts have in some material way not complied with relevant reporting requirements. In those cases, we will write to the company, initially to the chairman, um, and set out a number of questions uh, that uh, uh, we expect the company to answer. Uh, we then enter into a one or more rounds of correspondence with the company until we get a satisfactory conclusion. Um, those substantive letters usually um, uh, include uh, uh, some appendix points as, as well. Uh, so that's the only one, the substantive letter is the only one that requires a formal response from us. Um, and I think that's all I'm going to say in terms of my introductions. I'm now going to hand over to, to Robert, who's going to take us initially through the large private company thematic. Thanks, Rob. Brilliant. Thank you very much, John, for that. So as John said, there's a couple of areas I'm going to cover today. First of all, I'm going to talk to you about the, the thematic review of large private companies, which we published back in January of this year. Um, and then I'm going to take you on for a quick whistle-stop tour through our recently published annual review of corporate reporting. 
So John's outlined the reasons why we thought it'd be useful to talk to you today about um, our large private company thematic and the crossover there in terms of the reporting requirements for AIM companies, very similar to those of large private companies. So what do we cover in terms of our sample? Well, um, we picked a sample of 20 um, large private companies. We, we complete a desktop review similar to all of our reviews. We're, we're kind of picking up the accounts cold. We, we, look, we look through them um, and then we write any queries that we have as John's outlined to the company. In terms of the year ends that covered, those were year ends between September and December 2022, which might sound like a little bit of a while ago now. Um, obviously, private companies have longer to report um, than listed companies. So um, we were actually looking at those kind of in, in the second half of last year, 2023, with the report being issued at the beginning of 2024. Now, the sample covered both IFRS as well as UK GAAP, so um, some companies reporting under FRS 101, FRS 102. Um, I'll focus mostly on the IFRS requirements, which I'm aware most AIM companies will be reporting under IFRS, but I'm aware actually that some of those things, particularly FRS 101, might be relevant for your standalone parent company accounts within, your, uh, within consolidated accounts, for example. In terms of what we covered in the review, you'll see on the right hand side, um, those are the different areas that we picked out to focus on. So we didn't look at the whole uh, the whole report for our thematic review, it simply, you know, would, would just take, take too long to look at uh, that level of detail. We might have points all over the place. In terms of why we focused in on those, really, those are the areas that we, we concluded were the most important to users. So, um, the, the, the reason sitting behind that as well were the fact that actually there were we also thought there might be the highest risk of non-compliance. Um, that's based on the fact that all of these areas had been within our kind of top 10 areas that we'd written to companies on over the last five years or so. Um, and so that's why we focused in on those. So then moving on to what did what did we find? What were our key observations? Um, in, in terms of our, our key observations, we tried to really focus on what did um, what did good look like? If I could have the next slide, please, if that's right. Um, we tried to focus on 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 what on what the best quality reporting was across our samples. So our overall message was the quality of reporting was mixed. We saw some really good examples at the top end, and we also saw some examples that fell perhaps quite a long way below what we would have expected. Um, so there was a real mix there, and that was particularly in, in terms of how well some of those really key issues were explained. So um, really, um, you know, the better examples really focus in on those matters that were kind of material and particularly important for users of the accounts in terms of what they're going to be focusing on, particularly where there might be, you know, complex judgments or estimates involved. Those were explained, um, you know, nice and clearly in terms of, uh, in terms of the reporting. Um, one thing we found from, from some of the points that we picked up and we wrote to companies about was actually many of these issues could have been avoided by kind of a really good pre-issuance review, you know, a critical review of the annual report and accounts before they're issued. I'm sure all of you uh, that are listening today um, go through those kind of procedures, but, you know, we're picking accounts up cold. We're spotting the same things that somebody can pick up if they just want to pick up a set of accounts. And sometimes we know what it's like when you're, you know, in the midst of preparing an annual report and accounts. Um, sometimes you just need to take that step back and have a, have a think about actually, you know, have we really covered the key things here? You know, have we made them clear and concise? Um, have we really focused in on the things that users are going to be uh, going to be focusing on? And have we made sure that there's consistency um, across the different areas of the of the annual report and accounts? So if I move on to my my next slide, um, so in terms of some of the key observations around the strategic report, you know. It's again, it's drawing on that theme in terms of, you know, really focusing on those elements that were key for an understanding for users. Um, so we're making making sure that, you know, the, the strategic report was clear and concise and understandable. Um, and also the consistency with the financial statements. It's, it's one of the things that probably drives most of our points that we raise, um, or quite a few of the points that we raise with companies, is where one part of the annual report says something different to somewhere else. You know, the financial statements say one thing and actually the, the, the blurb in the in the strategic report is saying something slightly different in terms of messaging, which seems inconsistent. Um, so it's just making sure again, it's taking that step back to make sure that that all makes um, that all makes sense. Something I'll stress here, and you, you'll see it again coming through in the annual the annual report that we've issued recently as well. Good quality reporting does not necessarily require greater volume. And thinking about what that really means, it, it means actually, you know, some of the best examples we saw were far from the longest strategic report. It's very easy sometimes, I think people want to put more and more and more and more info in. But actually, you know, it's really focusing on what are those particular transactions, events or circumstances that a user is going to be interested in and making sure those are nice front and centre. Uh, and then perhaps omitting some immaterial information that, that users might not be so interested in. Um, so it, we're not trying to encourage companies to just put, you know, longer and longer uh, strategic reports. We're already aware how much the annual report has grown over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, we're really asking companies to focus on on those key issues that they should be uh, that users are going to be interested in. 
In terms of um, in terms of some of the other points that we we highlighted, um, if you move on to the next slide, please. Um, the first point here you'll see about explaining the nature of the company's operations. Now, the sample we looked at of large private companies, there was a range of different companies. So quite a few of those were preparing consolidated group accounts. There was also some companies that were preparing standalone accounts. So perhaps they were consolidated into an overseas um, an overseas group further up the chain, or in, or in one or two instances, they were just kind of standalone companies. Um, what we found was actually, you know, in, in one or two instances in particular, it was very hard to understand what that particular company's role or function was within their group. Um, and so actually they could have benefited from a bit more explanation around the wider group structure. In fact, in one instance, it was hard to actually understand how the, the particular company was generating revenue. We could understand how the group worked and what the group did overall, but it wasn't clear how, how this particular company fitted into that. And obviously it's a standalone set of accounts under UK requirements that should have been explaining that. In terms of um, revenue, you know, clearly revenue was was uh, was an important area to look at for all of the companies. The the main things we found that, that differentiated between you know a, an okay or perhaps a poor example and a really good example was often in the revenue policies. So, um, you know, it's about having a policy that's tailored to the um, about policy that's tailored to the company. So it's making clear, you know, the nature of each of the revenue streams. You know, focusing on the material streams. Okay, you know, we do X or Y, or you know, we we've got three areas of our business, and this is how we treat each of these different streams. It explains clearly the timing of recognition. So, you know, being aware of the of the requirements of the reporting standards, IFRS 15, if you're under um, IFRS, you know, at what point is revenue actually recognised, and also how is that revenue measured? Um, you know, thinking again, you know, in terms of IFRS 15, you know, is there a constraint on when we can actually recognise that revenue? If so, at what point do we feel that that constraint has been has been removed and we can recognise the rest of the revenue? So, as I say. The best policies really, um, really explained that, um, explained that well. On the top right here, you've got, you know, about other policies. Our general finding of accounting policies was was trying to encourage companies to just kind of avoid boilerplate or or untailored policies, particularly again for those those uh, transactions that are going to be of significant focus. So you'll see this graph in the bottom right. Um, it's actually come straight out of the thematic. It's really encouraging you to think about in your next reporting in terms of actually which are the areas that are particularly complex and judgmental and of those, which of those are significant, either quantitatively or qualitatively, that users are going to want to focus on. For those things that are kind of ticking both those boxes, that top right area of the graph, those are the areas that we really think companies should focus on. And again, we saw some really good examples of really kind of well-tailored policies that explain, look, this particular estimate is, is really quite complex. And this is, you know, we, we some companies might have said, you know, well, the, the accounting standard says this will stop. The better company said, actually, do you know what? This is how we've, this is how we calculate the, the value of these assets. This is the basis that we do it on. And they explain that nice and clearly in their accounting policy. So again, it's just thinking about actually, is there something we need to explain to users here? And is this an, an important area of our accounts that we should be explaining? If I could have the next slide, please. Um, so this is the last set of key observations that we we had from our report, um, covering some of the other areas that uh, that we focused on. The first couple are covering um, kind of significant judgments and estimates. Um, clearly, these are often likely to be, you know, if if you're if they're being disclosed as a significant judgment or estimate, they're likely to be uh, be significant to the accounts overall. Um, what set a good, a really good quality judgment apart from others um, is it? actually kind of really clearly explain what the specific judgments and rationale was so that was again about being specific in terms of you know it's not just all that you know it, it's um there's a judgment here around whether we control a company full stop you know in some instances we, we saw it as simple as that it's actually saying you know uh, the better example said look there's a judgment here around whether we control subsidiary x um and actually the reason we've concluded we do control it is you know y and z because these are the factors that we've considered and these are the ones we think are the most important in reaching that control conclusion so it's really kind of explaining to users that that process you've been through in reaching that judgment conclusion in terms of estimates um we found you know that actually it was it was much easier when sense, uh, the sensitivity of estimates was quantified. So those reporting under IFRS, um, there's a requirement in IAS 1 uh, to report on the sensitivity of the estimates. Um, and, and what that really allows is it allows the significance of, you know, to become much more apparent when those sensitivities are disclosed. So it's thinking clearly about, well, actually, how much can could this estimate move by within the next 12 months? And actually, you know, what does that look like? And let's quantify that amount. It allows the user to then just understand, actually, oh, OK, that's why that particular estimate is going to be significant because it could increase by you know uh, 50 million here or there 
last couple of areas just to touch on there um the first was around provisions we were we were not all of the companies that we looked at had provisions but where they were included we were a little bit um disappointed certainly it was below the level we expected in quite a few cases um that was particularly in terms of um kind of explaining the nature of the obligation and what, what is the provision you know and what is the uncertainty associated with that provision um, again it's really important because i think users value those kind of information because it allows them to really fully understand some of the risks in the business clearly if there's significant provisions within a company they're going to want to understand well actually what does that risk look like how is that potentially going to um, potentially going to evolve so it's making sure that the requirements of the standard are, uh, are being met in terms of disclosing that uh, that detail the final point there around financial instruments. So the main thing we, we had on financial instruments that we found was particularly poor was around the disclosure of the financial instrument risks. So there's requirements within IFRS 7 for IFRS reporters, and there's some requirements as well in the, um, in the Companies Act um, for companies under UK GAAP. The main risk we found that was disclosed by most companies was related to liquidity, as you might, you might expect. You know, a, a standard example just just kind of talked about you know it's very boilerplate and generic it described the nature of the risk you know i think probably everybody on this on this call is likely to understand what liquidity risk is and um, the really good examples went further than that and they explained why it was relevant to the particular company you know what what that looks like for them um, and what they're doing in terms of um, actually addressing that risk so what do they um, you know what what procedures they got in place to try and address that risk so again it's about being about being specific so that's what I wanted to say about the reporting of the large private companies. As John mentioned, we've recently published our annual review of corporate reporting. So within the last um, couple of weeks, um, you know, it's an annual review, as you expect, we, we publish it every year. But what it does is it allows us to give kind of uh, a, a test as to, you know, take the temperature of the current uh, current status of reporting. And we pull into that all of the cases that we've looked at over the last 12 months. So in terms of our in terms of our key findings, you see them here on the slide. I'll unpick the headline to start off with. So, um, you know, we 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 stated that the quality of the FTSE 350 is reporting has been maintained. We're a little bit concerned this year, certainly, that we're starting to see some evidence of a gap in terms of the quality of reporting between the FTSE 350 and some of the other companies that we look at. So that might be other other companies listed on the main market, AIM companies, and and large private companies and LLPs. Um, we 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 will dive into the numbers in, in a minute or two but it, you know in terms of that we, we don't want to be complacent about this because we're quite aware actually that some of these other entities outside the FTSE 350 have you know historically they are kind of some of the energies you know that the, the some of the, the real growth areas of the UK economy so we want to make sure that the quality of reporting is maintained for those companies as well as those at the, the top end of the market where generally they might have a little bit more um, kind of corporate reporting um, uh, resource available. In terms of some of the specific areas we were finding, uh, we were kind of writing to companies about, um, we, we've noticed there are, you know, a, a need for improvement still in relation to impairment and cash flow statements. Both of those areas have been in our top 10 for a while, um, but both of them are at the top again this year. And so we were, we were disappointed and we'll dive into some of the, the details of the specific things we we're finding very shortly. Um, You'll notice at the very bottom of the slide there, we, we've got a repeat there from basically the same wording that we had in the large private company thematic. It, it's an ongoing theme we're finding that actually, you know, you don't necessarily need lots of volume to make the best disclosure. It's about really focusing in on on some of those things. So you know, from that third point in terms of, you know, really being clear and consistent in terms of disclosure around uncertainties and risks um, that might be affecting the company. And also thinking about explaining clearly how, you know, what assumptions you've made as part of you know your financial reporting in terms of your financial position or when you're valuing assets and liabilities we're aware that you know some of the inflation driven uncertainties might have just just come back a little bit over the last the last few months but you know that there remains other other factors still in terms of you know concerns about low growth within the economy and some of the other geopolitical risks going on so we think it's really important that companies are are, are being nice and clear on those factors in terms of climate related reporting i'll touch on it later on in terms of the cfd requirements which apply to some uh, some companies on the aim market but if i could have the the next slide please so uh, this here just kind of illustrates in numbers uh, the reviews so th those boxes at the top show the total number of queries we've raised with companies um, you'll see overall we wrote to 243 companies in that table on the left um, over the, the last year, the 23-24 reporting year. Um, and of those, it was 115 companies that we wrote to with substantive letters that John explained. That's where we asked the company to kind of write back and explain to us how they'd applied reporting or disclosure requirements. 
the thing I think that we're, we're, we're concerned here, which kind of drives the, the, the differential here, is you, you'll see that, you know, in for FTSE 350 companies, only 28% of, of letters written to those resulted in a substantive letter, whereas 61% for those outside of uh, the FTSE 350 had a substantive letter. Um, just to give you the aim, the aim numbers there, in, in total over the last year, we wrote to 48 AIM companies, and of those, 36% received a substantive letter. So that's 75% of the, the companies that we looked at on the AIM market received a substantive letter. So it just shows that, that potentially at the moment, we're just finding that we might be more likely to have questions with some of those companies outside the FTSE 350. In terms of trying to, you know, uh, uh, avoid getting a letter from us. It's about focusing, focusing your reporting, making sure that you're explaining some of those real um, key estimates and uncertainties. In terms of the um, the bottom, uh, the bottom, and I'll just say actually, you know, overall we that gives you know a right rate of 47% substantive letters. We'll be clear that we don't have you know kind of a target in terms of the rate we want to write to at companies. Um, Throughout the whole process, we're trying to apply um, a proportionate approach, really focusing in terms of whether or not things are are material. And as I say, we're kind of considering that every stage of our work. Um, so it's not like, oh, we've got to write to X amount of X amount of companies. We just want the quality of corporate reporting to kind of constantly be uh, be improving um, in line with the accounting standards and other requirements. Um, the bottom section here uh, refers to required references, which which essentially are where companies have had to make restatements following our interaction. Um, not every restatement that a company might make is is uh, leads to a required reference. These are generally where there's been kind of a significant aspect of reporting that's been uh, been impacted. Most often it will be a restatement of a primary statement, but it might in some instances be some other kind of significant disclosures that are relevant to a company. And what we ask the company to do is we ask them to refer to their discussions and correspondence with us um, in their note about the restatement, just to highlight the fact that actually the reason they're making the restatement is coming out of our, our review. You'll see that the total number of companies with required references have been fairly stable over the last three years. There was 26 um, this year. However, again, you, you'll notice a slight trend there that actually, you know, the, the number of required references for FTSE 350 companies has been trending downwards, whereas the, the number for other companies has generally been uh, trending upwards as well. Um, in terms of um, AIM companies, actually, of, of those 26, 12 of those required references related to companies on the AIM market, um, of which the focus of those match very much. You'll see on the right-hand side, you've got the, the split there in terms of uh, the main reasons for the restatement. Um, seven of those 12 for AIM companies related to cash flow statements, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what those might be in a minute, um, with the other ones mostly relating to uh, changes to other primary statements or impairment, particularly impairment in relation to um, parent company investments and some of their subsidiaries. So what does um, what does our top 10 look like this year, which is normally the thing that people are most interested in? Um, well, as I mentioned, impairment of assets has, has maintained its top spot, um, which you know is disappointing for us. It, it's clearly uh, an area that's uh, that's very significant. Cash flow statements as well is, you know, it's third last year, it's second this year. I think you know, over 10% of companies that we're writing to are raising points on impairment of assets or cash flow statements, which is which is certainly higher than we would um, we would like it to be. Um, in terms of some of the things that we're finding, so in terms of impairment of assets, what what led us to to write to to companies? Um, uh, certainly one of the, one of the big areas related to kind of inconsistent assumptions. So again, it comes down to you know the accounts telling uh, accounts and annual report telling a consistent story. There's things perhaps in the front end that are explaining certain things that don't marry up with the assumptions that have then been used in the impairment testing. And so we've written to companies to understand how those two things kind of correlated um, and, and, and whether there should have been kind of a crossover and whether they were inconsistent at all. In some instances that it was concluded they weren't. Um, also, uh, allocating goodwill across um, across cash generating units was another area where we've written to companies. We also found this year there was quite a number of instances where we wrote to companies relating to potential impairment of uh, investments in subsidiaries within their parent company accounts. Um, obviously, this can have an impact on on distributable profits within that parent company, and particularly where some companies have had to make restatements for that. So it can be quite um, quite important. One of the things that, you know, one of the obvious drivers for us that might, that might indicate there might be an issue is where perhaps, you know, net assets overall for that parent company um, is um, is far exceeding the market cap of the of the group overall, which perhaps has got an indication that the, the investment they're holding in those subsidiaries might be uh, uh, might be overvalued. Not not necessarily a given, but it might be one of the indicators for us to consider and if there might be some other indicators as well to go with that. Um, 
there is requirements in terms of um, in terms of the accounting standards on disclosure and again it's about making sure you know if, if you're conducting an impairment review or if you made an impairment um, it's, it's making sure you're following those disclosure requirements and really explaining to users what's happened what's going on or why you're happy there isn't an impairment because often that's likely to be uh, be a fairly significant estimate for uh, for any set of financial statements in terms of cash flow statements, so those, as I say, that, that it's been an area which, if, if you've listened to our us talk on webinars before, uh, over the past few years, we, we continue to highlight issues with the cash flow statements. Often, it's something that's left later in the the, the reporting process. Um, sometimes things can get missed. Um, we continue to find some issues with um, the presentation. So whether or not cash flows are classified correctly within operating, investing, financing, and um, IS7 is is not the longest of standards, fairly old standard. Um, it, it's got some very clear requirements in there where certain cash flows sit. We still pick up from desktop reviews that some things have just been put in the wrong place. We've also found where some descriptions have perhaps been unclear. That's where another reason why I've written to companies. And in some cases, we've also found non-cash items being included in the cash flow. Uh, this particularly seems to be prevalent within uh, investing or financing cash flows. So just as a reminder, non-cash items should be excluded from the cash flow, and where they're significant or material, they should be they should be or significant and material. They should be disclosed somewhere else within the um, within the financial statements. Um, so what what are our expectations for uh, for reporting over the next year which i'm sure is going to be uh, be something for you to focus on in terms of your reporting within the next um, your next annual report and accounts so if i could just have the next slide please um we we've set out here some of our key expectations you know we really want to support companies in terms of making sure that they're complying with their reporting requirements and that that companies across the uk are continuing to deliver high quality information we're aware that good quality corporate reporting can you know can help um, help drive companies in terms of you know um, really really getting people to invest in them and be interested and make you know potentially drive uh, future investment Really, in terms of the way the, the UK model is set up, you know, uh, we're expecting directors to be applying careful judgment in terms of the preparation of annual report and accounts, um, in terms of, you know, the principles based approach that applies to accounting. These uh, areas on the slide that are detailed, they're also detailed as well in the, the actual annual review itself. Um, th these are some of the areas where we expect companies to really be focusing on. So I touched earlier on in terms of pre-issuance checks, it's one of the things we found from the large private companies um, as well in terms of in, in, ensuring there's a, a kind of a robust review process before the annual report is issued. Um, it's focusing again on those risks and uncertainties, areas where you know that there is lots of estimation, for example, um, or other areas where there might be uncertainties. Um, and then again, it's about you know narrative reporting in terms of ensuring that there's there's that kind of balanced review that's clear and concise within the, within the strategic report, making sure that it's uh, it, it matches up with what's disclosed in the in the financial statements um, you know one example we see is you know on kpi disclosures some companies will just disclose oh here's here's our kpis the better examples go on to explain well look, here's the analysis of us of the kpis that here's here's why these have moved within the year here's why they're important for us as a company and why we think these are the most uh, these are the key measures that we uh, there for uh, for our business um, in terms of our um, how we're getting on and also there's there's the point I've already made at the bottom in terms of taking that step back and really consider, you know, is everything consistent, coherent? Um, have you got all of the material information? But also there's a kind of the point here in terms of cutting clutter. Have you only included the material information? So, you know, you don't necessarily need if there's things there that aren't material, actually, could you cut those out and really help users just to focus on those more more uh, those more material and key areas of the annual review and accounts? Um, in terms of my my next slide just covers a little bit here in terms of how much is enough because i know that's one of the questions we we do sometimes get on our um our, our web our webinar you know talked here a second ago about you know it's a principles based reporting in the in the uk i think i think a key thing here is having that materiality mindset that i've already talked about in terms of what's what's material and um, we've highlighted some of the things here that might you know uh, some of the requirements that we have to uh, companies have to adhere to I think it's really important just to highlight that last sentence on the bottom of the slide here. You know, we don't expect companies to go um, to go beyond requirements in terms of what's within the actual accounting standards and the companies at themselves. But you have got things such as an IS1 that's highlighted there in that bottom bullet point that, that says actually, you know, do you need to provide some additional disclosures? The accounting standards are good at having specific disclosure requirements saying disclose X, Y, or Z. But actually, is, is there things that are so important to your accounts you need to go beyond those specific disclosures to really um, enable users to understand uh, understand those? Um, 
Moving on to my final slide, just highlighting some of the other thematic and sector focused reviews we've had during the year. Um, so the offsetting um, Colin's going to talk to you about in a minute, um, that was published recently. We've also recently published a, uh, a thematic review on IFRS 17, so anybody that's got inter uh, interest in insurance accounting um, can go and have a look at that. We're currently working on our climate related financial disclosures, the CFD disclosure thematic. Um, We've got the scope there, so this does capture some uh, some aim companies where you've got uh, employees of more than uh, more than 500 employees and turnover of more than 500 million. So we're doing kind of a, a deep dive just into looking at what what reporting looks like in the first year of compliance for uh, for aim and private companies. Um, we've also uh, done a little bit of a deep dive into retail uh, retail sector focus this year. So we've picked up a number of companies in the retail sector, which has been a, a, a sector that's really been um, struggling over the past few years, focusing on the impairment testing within those companies, uh, looking at their challenges they might face with lease property, um, and also um, also their use of APMs within their accounts, so alternative performance measures. The findings for those weren't published in a separate thematic, but instead they've kind of been given their own separate section of the annual review. So if you're interested in those, go and um, go and check those out and have a look. That's all I wanted to talk about in terms of the annual review. That was, I say, a whistle-stop tour. Don't forget there is there is an FRC thematic on the 17th of October. But I'll hand over now to Colin, who's going to take you through the offsetting thematic. Great. Thank you very much, Rob. <clears throat> uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm going to quickly walk you through uh, some of the key themes from our offsetting thematic. Now note this is offsetting in the financial statements. This is not uh, any uh, offsetting to do with sustainability reporting like uh, carbon offsets. Um, next slide, please. Uh, just a bit of bit of background. Um, unlike uh, Rob's private large private company thematic, we didn't use a sample for our thematic. We actually relied on our uh, findings from our regular monitoring work. And uh, when we looked at it, uh, there's a diagram on the right hand side, which shows where the practical application issues on offsetting come up. So just a note, what is offsetting? It's when we combine essentially dissimilar items into one line item in, in the balance sheet. So where we saw issues come up, IFRS generally prohibits this um, and allows it in certain instances. So we had issues where offsetting was not being applied appropriately, uh, particularly around uh, cash flow statement, uh, financial instruments, um, particularly I'm thinking about cash pooling arrangements and provisions. These were some of the the, the, the heavy hitters in in offsetting. And just why why does it matter? Why did we think uh, it would be good to do something on offsetting? Uh, there's a there's a few reasons, but I think one of them is if companies get offsetting wrong, it can affect key metrics such as. Uh, covenant ratios, efficiency uh, ratios. Um, and also we realized that there was, there was quite a few issues going on with offsetting across different standards. And none of these were really new. These, these requirements have been around for a long time. And we were finding companies seem to be getting them wrong, um, even in simple cases. Um, one of the reasons could be that the requirements differ across different standards. Um, and I've actually got a diagram on the next slide, which will just hopefully kind of summar summarize that for you. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think before I get onto this diagram, just to maybe note that um, when we looked at the population of offset, where offsetting issues were arising, we didn't really find any specific size of company or industry where offsetting issues were more uh, were more common. It was so it was an even spread really across the 4350 large companies, other listed aim companies, um, and across industries. I, I suppose one one area, one industry where where we didn't that seemed to be getting this stuff right consistently was, however, uh, the banking and insurance industry. So if we have a look at the next slide, um, this what this tries to do is bring a, a number of the offsetting requirements into one place. Um, at the top of the slide, in the in the navy blue, we've got the general prohibition on on offsetting, um, which is you can't do any offsetting unless it's required or permitted. There are some other reasons why one could do offsetting, but that, that that's the main that's the main premise. And then the azure blue block just below calls out some of the specific IFRS that go a little bit further than that and actually uh, require gross presentation in certain instances. Then we've got two arrows, the forest green one on the left, 
uh, contains a bunch of IFRS, uh, IFRSs where offsetting is required. Um, and then the, the uh, error on the right leads to a, a bunch of IFRS requirements where offsetting is essentially a policy choice. Now, in both of these two groups, there are instances where offsetting has no conditions attached and then others where there are conditions. Now, right at the bottom of the slide, there is a gray box and that does contain the uh, the IFRS, uh, exact IFRS references if you want to take a look. We do have this diagram as well in the offsetting thematic, which by the way, is, was released last month is, and is uh, uh, 25 pages. So uh, hopefully not, not too long a read in, in decently sized font. Um, but going on to the next slide, these are key expectations. Um, and really, they're, a lot, they're mostly based on IFRS requirements. So think about the first one. Accounting policies need to contain uh, all the conditions that relate to offsetting, uh, and that significant and, and uh, significant judgments should do, should be disclosed where offsetting has been applied, either on the balance sheet, income statement, or cash flow statement. Turning to the cash flow statement, um, in specifically investing and financing activities. Uh, these cash flows should be presented gross, so gross inflows, gross outflows, uh, except in the very limited uh, scenarios where that it may be presented uh, net and IS7. Staying with the cash flow statement and just thinking about uh, cash equivalents, uh, overdrafts uh, are sometimes included um, within cash equivalents. And what we're asking companies to do is just to consider whether they should be excluded when those overdrafts are uh, overdrawn for a number of reporting periods. And then moving over to the balance sheet, uh, and I think before I get there, just a note, uh, we do call this out in the, them in the thematic, but the requirements to include overdrafts within cash equivalents are very different to the, require to the requirements to offset overdrafts, uh, sorry, in the cash flow segment, are very different to offsetting overdrafts with positive cash balances in the balance sheet. So when we look at cash pooling arrangements, which is the vehicle that a lot of companies use these days to manage their cash, manage their liquidity and interest rate exposure, um, we'll have situations where they have uh, positive bank balances and, and overdrafts. We're really asking companies to consider the terms and conditions attached to those arrangements. For example, do they provide a uh, right that is currently enforceable to offset those balances? And not only that, are these uh, zero balancing or, or notional cash pooling arrangements because the treatment will differ, the offsetting treatment will differ or could differ. Um, and when and what, when thinking about the timing of cash sweeps versus reporting date, that's another good consideration. An area where we find a lot of companies come up short is on the intention requirement in IS 12 that talks about the company needs to have the intention to settle its, its uh, cash positive cash balances and overdrafts net. Um, and companies need, need, need to be able to demonstrate that at the reporting date. Uh, sticking with financial instruments and just thinking about disclosures, uh, we're reminding companies to produce high quality disclosures. I, I for 7 is the only standard that actually explicitly requires disclosures on offsetting. And it should be noted that these should be given whether uh, financial instruments are offset or even in certain situations where they're not offset but are subject to a master netting arrangement such as, such as a de derivative clearing agreement. And finally, just looking at the provisions, um, we have a, a reminder just for companies to present their any reimbursement assets separately from the provision and uh, to disclose any contingent assets related to reimbursement rights if it meets the uh, requirements and the uh, IS 37. I've got a little block on the right hand side there. It's just a reminder of the uh, IFRS uh, Interpretations Committee agenda decision of March 2016 that speaks a little bit more to the intention requirement of um, offsetting cash, cash and, and, and overdrafts under pooling arrangements. Um, moving on to the uh, a, a couple of case studies, or, uh, or more than that, actually, we've got a few case studies here, which I thought were, might be useful just to uh, bring some of these uh, offsetting uh, application issues alive to you. These are real life examples where we've identified uh, issues with companies and, and, and I'll just, uh, I'll in, in each of these scenarios, I'll, I'll include 
what actions the company took uh, as a result of our inquiry. So the first one is that we had a company that presented uh, net cash flows related to its notes payable. And when we, when we queried this with the company, it explained that it was settling them uh, quite quickly. Um, but when we queried it further, the company reconsidered its position because it realized that the, the maturities on these, on these notes payable were quite long. And uh, it then decided to uh, uh, correct the presentation by presenting cash inflows and outflows to the notes payable gross within financing activities um, going forward. Now, this was an issue because one of the exceptions to presenting cash flows gross for financing activities and investing activities is that the maturities need to be short, uh, for example, three months or less. We had another company, um, and this is looking at the definition of cash equivalence. This company included a an, an discount, invoice discounting facility within its uh, cash, cash equivalence line item in the cash flow statement. And um, when we queried this, the company uh, reconsidered its position and realized that the in discounting facility was not expected to ever be positive. It was always going to be an overdraft. And so it agreed to restate its financials, its uh, cash flow statement. Now, this was an issue because overdrafts can only form part of cash and cash equivalents in the cash flow statement when the balance fluctuates from being positive to being overdrawn. And there's an, uh, again, there's a, a IFRIC agenda decision um, that highlights that requirement. Um, then looking at the balance sheet now and cash pooling arrangements, the, we had a company that had an overdraft in, in the parent company's accounts. And when we looked at the consolidated accounts, we couldn't see any overdrafts and there was no disclosures around offsetting. So when we queried this with the company, it uh, said that although it had a right to offset the overdrafts with positive bank balances through a, a, a cash pooling arrangement that it had with the bank, that it could not demonstrate the intention to settle those balances net because it, is, it had used those balances for operational purposes after the reporting date. So that company also then agreed to uh, restate its fund, its balance sheet to present the cash and overdraft balances gross on the face of the balance sheet. And this was an issue because uh, companies uh, can only offset amounts, uh, overdrafts and positive bank balances in the balance sheet when there is an in in intention to exercise a legally enforceable right to offset the period in bank balances. And then finally, just looking at the provisions, um, there was a, we had a company that uh, in the front end uh, spoke quite confidently about uh, its ability to uh, get reimbursed through insurance contracts for certain claims uh, for certain provisions that that it had. But then when we looked in the in the back end of the accounts, we were unable to identify a reimbursement asset or any contingent asset disclosures. When we queried this with the company. It uh, came back to, to inform us that it had, in fact, offset the reimbursement asset against the provision and agreed to uh, restate its, its balance sheet as, as a result uh, to present the reimbursement asset separately from, from the provision. So, uh, yeah, th hopefully that's uh, helping some of these uh, issues alive to you. Um, and, uh, yeah, please look out for our thematic, which was released uh, last week. That's it for me. Over to you, John. Thank you very much, Colin. Um, so if you just move on to the next slide, I've only uh, got uh, well, one and a half slides, let's say, left uh, for, for my bit before we move on to questions. But actually, I'll deal with a, a question we've had in um, uh, just uh, uh, just uh, during uh, while we were talking, um, which is uh, just asking about um, the time frame that is, is allowed uh, for a response to any letters you might receive from us. Um, so uh, as Rob said, we um, we uh, write in excess of 200, uh, well, we review it in excess of 200 uh, sets of accounts each year. Uh, and on average, um, let's say sort of 40, 50% uh, 40, of, of those companies will get a substantive letter from us more in the end company, as, uh, end company market, as, as Rob said. Um, if you do get a, a letter from us, we do ask um, that you try to respond to us within 28 days um, of, of receipt. Uh, now, if if that is 
if, there's, if that's a problem for you, because perhaps, you know, it, it may, may hit during a holiday uh, season or a, a reporting uh, a, a, a reporting crunch point or or our questions may be particularly complex. Um, we we are reasonable people. So just just communicate with us and and uh, say uh, when you'll be able to get it back to us. And generally we are we'll accept um, a, a short a short delay uh, in, in your response. Uh, and I just wanted to say something uh, about the, the nature of the letters that, um, uh, that uh, or the, the way you should write back to us. As I said, we, we try and we try and answer things. Um, we try and have a collaborative uh, relationship with with you. And um, I think it's in everybody's interests to 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 get the um, to get the case settled uh, within uh, the shortest number of sort of letters as, as possible. So. Um, it may. It, what I've got on the slide here isn't exactly um, uh, uh, rocket science, but um, but it is it is really important. And I know from when when I was on the other side of the table at the firm at a firm uh, advising our clients on on how to um to to respond to FRC uh, queries, I, I had to really underline this. Um, and that is uh, answer the question that that the FRC has asked in our in our letter, uh, not the question you wish they may have asked or that you think they should be answering. Uh, you should you should be answering uh, because um, if if we don't get the the response uh, you know, a direct response really to to our question then then we will have to come back uh, and ask it again uh, in maybe a, a different way so so that's my top tip is just make sure you are answering the questions that we're asking um, be candid um, if you think that there uh, if 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 you have done something wrong don't don't defend a lost cause uh, admit it and say how you're going to to put it right because my, the majority of our um, uh, our cases are closed uh, through a, a prospective um, uh, correction. So either through a PPA in the next set of accounts or, or just putting things right in the next set of accounts. Um, it's worth also pointing out that in, in many cases, at least, um, the underlying accounting uh, that we are questioning isn't, isn't, isn't wrong. Um, so it is often a matter of clarity. We've obviously um, asked the question for a reason, and that's often because we just didn't understand what was going on. We couldn't find enough information in the accounts to, to persuade us that the things were right. Uh, and so uh, often companies uh, come back and say, we've done it right for these reasons, but we will clarify it uh, going forward. So um, I, think, I think they're my top tips uh, in, in terms of, of letters there. Um, so. If we can just move on to my final slide, and this is just going back to um, uh, uh, re-advertising the, the, the publications that we've been talking about today. So the annual review of corporate reporting, which has got uh, the statistics that, that Rob and I have just mentioned about how many companies we'd write to, uh, and a lot more information on, on the nature of, of the inquiries that we've made to companies, uh, that's available right now on the uh, FRC's website, uh, as is the largest private company thematic, uh, that we published um, at the beginning of this year, uh, and also the offsetting thematic that uh, Colin has just spoken about and was was published uh, a, a few weeks ago. Uh, so I would very much uh, recommend you go and have a, have a look through there. We, we tried very hard to make them accessible documents, uh, uh, and so you may well uh, learn something and at least um, see what what is more likely to to sort of um, uh, precipitate a letter from us if if you don't. Uh, if you don't do it. Um, and then finally, uh, one final plug for uh, our webinar, the FRC's webinar on the annual review of corporate reporting, where we'll go into a, a little bit more detail than, than Rob has been able to give you today. Uh, and that is on the 17th of October. And again, you can sign up to that on the um, FRC's website. Uh, and that's me. So back to you, uh, Duncan. Thank you, John and uh, Rob and, and Colin from the FRC team. Um, I can see that the, the Q&A chat function is working. So if anything, if anyone does have any, any more questions for the team or for Mike, um, who spoke earlier, then you know, very happy to take those. I'll give you some cha a chance to think about those. Um, I did have some some thoughts as the FRC team were coming, th were talking actually. and. If I might start with uh, Colin, if, if that's okay, just uh, you talked about offsetting um, and covered a lot of areas, actually, probably more areas than you that initially come to mind. But the one that came to mind for me was income taxes and taxes as a category. So I just wondered if you were seeing offsetting issues in, in that area and what they might be. Yes. Yeah, no, that, that's, that, that's a good question. Uh, Income taxes is an area where we're seeing offsetting, particularly issues, uh, particularly around uh, deferred tax. 
uh, sometimes these things aren't, aren't material, but when it when it is material, we we, we take an interest. Um, and what we've seen is we've seen instances where companies have uh, offset deferred taxes when they're operating in multiple jurisdictions, and all of, all balances have been have been offset. And we've seen you know what one one number on the balance sheet. Uh, so, so so that's going to be an issue um, because one of the requirements in IS twelve is that the uh, the you can only offset if they're related to the same tax jurisdiction. We've also seen the opposite, where uh, companies have not offset any of their deferred taxes, uh, even though they're only operating in, in in the UK. Now there can be reasons for that. You know, you can have uh, uh, capital losses that can't be offset against revenue gains, yeah, which is fine. But for all uh, for all deferred taxes not to be offset it wasn't a bit odd in, in both cases we worked with the companies and and actually uh the ones that i'm thinking of and 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 we we did secure a, a, a restatements for those but it's just thinking about those requirements and in our in, in is 12 and the, the tax jurisdiction particularly is, is something to, 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 to think about okay thank you colin that's very helpful and then um finally then for rob you were talking in the annual review about two areas, the, the sort of top 10 issues. Um, I think you mentioned revenue and financial instruments. You talked about revenue a bit, but don't. what about financial instruments? You know, what what are you seeing there that you're raising with companies and what kind of issues are you, are you thinking of? Um, yes. That? Yeah, so that was the third highest area that we wrote to, to companies on. Um, um, uh, there was a mix, really, in terms of the points we we're raising with companies. There was quite a few company-specific points in terms of some of the the instruments, you know, that we might have written to them about. Again, the annual review goes into more detail on those. Uh, quite a few of the points that we've raised in the current year have related to the expected credit loss requirements um, and the disclosures around those um, and whether or not companies have been applying those appropriately. Again, the annual report expands on the specifics of those, but really, again, it's, it's one of those areas where there's likely to be quite a lot of judgment and estimate involved. Um, so it's making sure that your disclosures are clear in terms of the policy that you've, 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 you've applied in terms of those ECL disclosures. Okay, great. Thank you. And I've got another question that's come through on the chat. So, uh, cutting the clutter, what are your thoughts on immaterial information about material items? Um, is a one-line policy for each material area still area still expected, no matter how routine? Yeah, this is a tricky one, isn't it? Um, I would. Um, the uh, IS one requires uh, information about material accounting policies. Um, I would hesitate to say that a, a one a one sentence thing uh, would would, would uh, be enough. So, for example, uh, business combinations are accounted for uh, using the acquisition method. Method full stop. Moving on. Uh, I don't think I I would um uh, I would advocate for that. Um, but I think the easier wins uh, on that is you often read accounting policies that um, cover off aspects of, of, let's say, business combination accounting uh, that have got no relevance to, to the accounts in question. So you often see um, policy uh, elements of a policy that deal with non-controlling interests or contingent consideration uh, or, or those sorts of aspects, which which haven't which, which aren't appear, which don't appear in those those particular accounts. So if you were to take a red pen through and say the, these aspects of the policies uh, are the bits that actually are relevant to my accounts, and I think already you're able to, to cut the accounting policy note down quite a lot and also have a look at um, you know policies policies for things that uh, that just haven't happened in the last couple of years um, I often have uh, again when I was back in practice um, you had companies saying you, you challenge company why have you got this policy in and they say well I might need it next year um, uh, and I think you can take you know you can't you can um, rationalize that note one quite a lot just by using those easy wins Great. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I'm not seeing. Oh, I think we do have another question come through. So, um, what about policies such as share capital and dividends when the company only has ordinary shares and there is no accounting judgment to be applied? Um, well, I think I think it's a, it's a similar answer. I, I think if if we said that only only uh, policies where judgment um, or accounting policy choice that is the only uh those are the only words you need in your accounting policy note then then i think that would probably be a little bit um uh, briefer than i would expect um but again you don't you don't need you don't need more than a couple of lines for most of those things i i don't think you'd be receiving a letter from us if you didn't have a share capital uh, accounting policy i must say 
um, but, but um, you know, it depends on, on the um, you know, uh, on, on the exact facts and circumstances of the company and the materiality of the balances as well. Yeah, I think the point I was making when I talked originally about accounting policies was that the areas where we don't expect to see kind of generic or boilerplate policies is going to be those areas where you have got more significant judgment estimation and it's also kind of quantitatively or qualitatively material. And um, so that, that's really that's the focus I was trying to drive towards. So if that didn't come across, that's that's what we we're aiming for. So it, for those areas, it's not having that boilerplate or generic policy. OK, so what we the, the thought process is, um, if it's going through your head that there might be some judgment involved, then perhaps write more. And if there isn't, then don't. That's right. And uh, and if you are um, if your company's circumstances are a little more unique, then then you might need a little bit more. And that is often the case, for example, for a revenue policy, because every business does things slightly differently. And that's where we might expect a little bit more color, uh, whereas PP and E, for example, um, you, you 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 perhaps um, be able to pare that down a little bit more just to the bare minimum. OK, thanks, team. Um, time's moving on. Um, I do want to give uh, the attendees chance to ask Mike a question as well if anything has come to mind just a quick reminder um, Mike talked about the market outlook for AIM issues facing AIM as a market full stop ideas for reform um, he also talked about the QCA code and um, compliance with that and then the, the new principle um, of uh, around remuneration so I just want to give people the chance to ask Mike a question who, who was speaking earlier not seeing anything come through um and then just a quick reminder then that uh the, the frc team talked about large private companies the thematic review there um their annual review of corporate uh reporting as well and then offsetting finally in in the financial statements those are the main things that we covered this morning so um, hopefully I've given you enough time there to answer any burning questions. Um, we're coming to a close now. I just want to say thank you all for uh, joining us this morning. You know, do get in touch um, with your local or normal PKF contact. Um, if you think there's some follow up required uh, that might be more specific to your circumstances. Um, otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day. And, you know, I hope your next round of corporate reporting and financial year and goes goes well and more smoothly as a result so thank you for joining us and see you soon